next speaker is uh, <clears throat> Robert Mark. He's an award-winning journalist. He was nominated twice for the Airbus, what? Aerospace Journalist. Of the Actually, I wasn't nominated. I got it. Oh, you got it. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. Didn't I? I've since sold him, though. The Airbus? Times, yeah. Times oh, are okay. Hard. Plus, Wait, he is... Uh, is oh, he's, well, he's, he's on his way. Plus, uh, he was very often asked by Fox News and some other major networks uh, to be an expert commentator, for instance. He's, I asked him to, to make a presentation on, on seaplanes uh, because I thought it was an interesting subject that belongs in the Caribbean. There's some history and there's certainly some potential and somebody's got to point it out. And Rob put some extra work in the research and so on. So he made a presentation now. Uh, we, we managed to get a seaplane here. The seaplane is provided by uh, Tropic Ocean Airways. And the other Rob, it's very confusing. We've got two Robs here. This Rob and that Rob. Yeah, and we've got one and more actually. They're going to do it together. And uh, well, you tell me after when, who was better of the two. The, the thing that I found interesting, and of course I met Rob through Bud, because of course I was asked to, to simply talk about seaplanes, and uh, I'm seaplane rated, but I said just talking about it doesn't, it doesn't grab people. I don't think it has the same effect as having someone here to you know, kind of bounce ideas off of business-wise, but also someone that's flying them a lot. And uh, that's how we linked up with uh, um, uh, Tropic Ocean Airways. Uh, and you know, again, they've, they've grown a business out of Florida doing this, the largest caravan EX operator in the world. This is really impressive stuff. And only in a couple of years. You've been a busy guy. We've been busy. Yeah. Been busy. And uh, so, you know, but before we go off to one other thing, I just want to introduce our guests since I have no idea exactly who these men are because <laughs> Rob just dealt this on well, me, completely threw me out of whack. So, would yeah, you guys. Uh, I, I thought since we're discussing seaplanes um, and now that I know the shoreline folks are here, it's, sure. it's, it's imperative that we bring them up here. Um, John Kelly and Richard here. John Kelly has Shoreline Aviation started out in New York with 38 years ago. 38 years. And he has operations in the Bahamas, operations in the Virgin Islands. Uh, Richard's a rep representative down here, uh, retired American Airlines pilot. And you know, for everything that that I know, multiply it by a thousand in the seaplane realm, and it's these guys um, are the ones to, I think, pose questions to about the viability of seaplanes in the tourism industry. Yeah, and I, I think we're going to have a little fun this afternoon. Uh, we're, you know, we've been hearing this think outside the box thing uh, all, all day, and uh, what does that really mean? So we're, we're going to talk about something that we haven't talked about uh, yet, and that is seaplanes. And uh, I'm curious, uh, see, for me, th this is really an odd one. Where, where is Bud? Where did he disappear to? He's over in the corner. Oh, there you are. Okay. When he called me and asked me to do something about seaplanes, I thought, I am probably the worst person to ask about seaplanes because uh, I, I don't like water. I really don't. I, I can't even swim. And uh, we used to take uh, one of the hawkers that I flew from the mainland. We used to go down to Trinidad a lot down into Venezuela, and we'd be up there at, I don't know, you know, 37,000. and. We'd see nothing but water, and, and the other guy would go, "Oh, hey, Rob, I think I think the engine's quit. No, you know, we may have to get out of the water here. You know, it was, it was a big funny thing. I, of course, luckily, you know, turbine engines are pretty reliable, so it never really uh, uh, hit me much. But but what I think actually really brought this home to me is that I had a student, an early private student, years and years ago, really good student, learned flying, bought himself a high performance airplane and said, hey, you know, I want to take the thing down to the Bahamas. I said, well, all right, wow, sound good to me. I said, just make sure you've got a raft and that you don't put the raft in the trunk because if you ever went down, you'll never get the damn thing out. Uh, and uh, I said, make sure if you, ever, if you ever go down in the water, just remember, you just gotta open that door a little bit in case the, you know, all the stuff I'd been taught as an instructor, which never happens. And so, uh, don't I find out after the guy's gone about four days, uh, his sister calls me on the phone and says, uh, Paul's uh, missing. I said, whoa. I said, what do you mean missing? Well, he was out 
in the, it was a blank of Viking for those of you that might know what that is, but uh, single engine high performance. And uh, they put the airplane down in the water and they were on a raft for two days uh, out around Eleuthera. And uh, when he came back, uh, we all had this big party about, you know, how great it was that uh, he was back and, uh, you know, we felt really good. And uh, in the meantime, I just realized uh, you were supposed to tell me to put my presentation up on the screen here. So anyway, <laughs> so uh, anyway, but when we, uh, we, we brought this uh, fellow back, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting because uh, he mentioned to me that he'd, uh, he'd been found by some kind of big seaplane. What well, was an old albatross uh, from uh, the uh, Coast Guard station in Miami? Let's see if this runs. Oh, that, that's your, for those of you that haven't ridden on a seaplane yet, this is an early seaplane. And for you historians, please don't ask me what that is. I stole it from the internet. It's an old Felix Stowe. But uh, this is actually what uh, found my buddy um, down in the Luther there. And boy, were they happy to see these guys when they, uh, when they came flying by. Um, but, you know, it, it really brought home to me the fact that seaplanes are very, very special. Seaplanes, uh, of course, definition. We have amphibians, which is really what that is, because it'll land on the water or on the, uh, uh, on the land, as will your caravan, I found out yesterday, or was it the day before when I tried that. Uh, you just don't want to land in the water with the wheels down. That's really bad. Uh, but you know, I did think about what, what, a, what a cool business it is, even then. But we don't have, I'm from Chicago, and we don't have a whole lot of seaplane operations up there, a little bit in the upper lakes in Minnesota and uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, but not much, certainly in Illinois. Um, but uh, that's more my kind of seaplane flying. This is actually what I got my seaplane rating in, but this looks so peaceful and so, so calming uh, that, you know, how, how could you not want to do something like this? This is so fun. It really is. And, uh, I, uh, that was my first experience with seaplanes, but again, that's when I started thinking, wow, what a, what a cool business this would be. But of course, this guy is running a business as a, an instructor, giving people seaplane rides. And there's actually more to it than that, uh, as I'll show you here. Let's see. That is Vancouver Tower. How's that for you there, Duncan? Uh, actually, you know what that is? It's not really Vancouver Airport's tower. That is the tower in Vancouver Harbor for the seaplane operation. They have so much traffic in that harbor that they need a tower. So they built a tower on top of an office building. It's just kind of sticking out right down there in the middle of downtown Vancouver. Um, and uh, what's, what's kind of neat about it is that you'll see things like this. Let's see, and I'm going to have to figure out how to make this one work. Let's try this. That doesn't do it. Well, that wasn't it. Okay, I know how to turn it off. So how did you get the video to run on this thing again? Can I do it from here? All right. think you were on the uh, ground there uh, here or someplace else and uh, I thought this one was kind of neat though coexisting with the neighbors we don't care about no boats no big deal we all work together so uh, what I think is interesting, though, is that this is more uh, the speed of where we are right now, not up there where it's cold and damp and rainy and 
you know, people want to be close to the water, and and that's why we're here. Um, well, let's see. What's that? That's that's on a rainy day. I skipped a spot. Oh, we don't want to see another one. That's all right. You know what they look like when they're coming out of there. Oh, here we go. This is the this is dinner tonight. In case you didn't know that, uh, Bud's cooking that. Uh, but you know when we have people that are coming to a location like this, tourists or or high net worth people or whatever they're doing. Um, you know the the boat rides are okay. Gosh, I hope there's nobody here from a boating company. I don't want to. But I, I mean, I'm not a boat guy, but then we already covered my love of water earlier on. So, uh, but you know, they, they look at convenience, they look at speed. And, and so really, there are so many things that we could do in a different way uh, than what we're doing. Oh, look at that. Now there's a pier and there's an airplane at the end. Wow, what a cool idea. Um, so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, about the airports that we use. And, and the nice thing about uh, a seaplane, a float plane, uh, an amphib, whichever you want to call it, is that uh, it can pretty much land anywhere. Absolutely, it doesn't, you don't need a hard surface runway to, uh, to, make it, uh, to make it pay. And uh, one thing I thought was kind of interesting when we started talking about doing seaplanes down here is I, I, I started to try to find information about seaplane operators down right in this area. And, and there's not a lot of seaplane activity here. Isn't it crazy? We've got water everywhere. There's more water here than there is in Vancouver, and Vancouver looks like JFK. Wow, what an opportunity. At least that's what I thought. Um, so, I mean, there are an awful lot of benefits to operating a seaplane down in this region. But rather than go through them all myself, I'm going to let any of my panelists just jump in and say, why should they have seaplane operations down here? Well, you know, Rob, I mean, you kind of hit it on the head that, that seaplanes open up. You can up tell he's the jet pilot, right? He just jumps in. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm excited about it. Yeah, too. no, it, um, it is. Uh, I think seaplanes, seaplanes open up a lot, I think, for the different communities. Um, you had a picture of the Maldives there. The Maldivian air taxi flies around to a couple of islands, and they, they have, like you said, you know, an operation like running out of JFK. Whereas you look at the Bahamas, which has 720 islands, and there's really only two um, seaplane companies, uh, actually one coming in from the U.S., well, two actually seasonally, and then one seaplane company, Seabird, that really operates inner island. And I always wondered, you know, why is that? And I think that there is a lot of, um, I would say, archaic uh, resistance to allowing seaplanes to operate, and some of it is valid. Um, as you said, sir, earlier, you know, it's not dangerous, it's challenging, right, or exciting. Um, seaplanes have a higher level of risk associated with them. So seaplane operators have to do a good job of mitigating that risk and then proving to the local governments that although this may seem like a higher risk operation, we've lowered that level of, of risk to an acceptable risk. And a lot of people, by the way, who don't come from aviation background hear risk and they get scared, but the reality of it is, Flying in any airplane in a piece of metal at 20,000 feet behind a controlled explosion is stupid and risky. But the aviation community does a great job of mitigating that risk. So, so I think there's been some pushback, I think, from the governments. And I think the second point, um, some of the re uh, challenges I think we've seen was also the concern about smuggling. Because you could land a seaplane anywhere, you could smuggle something anywhere. So I think it's important to create partnerships with um, operations that have a good track record. I think, and, and uh, I'd say some experience behind what, it. What about the benefits? Lots of benefits, obviously. Just, um, like you said, look, uh, you mentioned earlier about the boats. Um, when we come into a region, we're not looking to compete with the boat operators. We're not looking to compete with the larger 121 airlines. We're looking to supplement them. Because we're always a different price point, by the way, than the ferry boat driver. And so instead of taking business away, we're actually increasing business to that island because some of the higher net worth people don't want to spend three hours going through airports and taxis. They want to get on an airplane and 45 minutes later go right to the resort. So I think there's a huge benefit. Um, also, you know, servicing the communities, I'd say, during disasters and things. There's times that the runways are underwater that the seaplanes can get access. What do you guys think? What else? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one of those uh, 
older high time pilots that Bob has to retrain, uh, Rob has to retrain when he hires for his company. And, and <laughs> so I have a, a, perhaps a little bit uh, different perspective. And, and we have been operating down here in the region. We've had an operation in the, the Bahamas for about 15 years. Um, we originally came into the, uh, brought two caravan amphibians down to the British Virgin Islands uh, in 2007, which turned out to be kind of poor timing. Uh, based on the world economy and uh, pulled back out of that. We've been back now in the Virgin Islands, operating out of the U.S. Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands for about five years, also out of San Juan. And there, there's some tremendous advantages to being able to, uh, as Rob says, to, to take your high-end client, and we're really not competing with the, I mean, our, the biggest, uh, uh, where we get a lot of pushback in the Bahamas is from the taxi cab drivers. If we fly these people right into the resort rather than taking them to the airport, the taxi drivers don't get the fare from the airport to the to the resort. Well, that's a legitimate complaint on the taxi drivers' part. This is their living, their livelihood. We've handled that in the Bahamas by offering to to um, make contributions to 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 um, perhaps to the taxi drivers' association or to to pay an extra fee uh, that would go to the taxi drivers. We do, for instance, we go into uh, Harbor Island in the Bahamas and we, and we, rather than take the people to a beach or a dock, we employ the local water taxis as a way of, of uh, making sure that they don't lose the income that they would have lost by taking that passenger from the dock on one side to the dock on the other side. Um, here in the BVI, um, or working in the BVI and in the Caribbean region, uh, if you come into, if you fly in on the airlines to St. Thomas and you want to get to the Bitter End Yacht Club, for instance, in uh, Virgin Gorda, you can, uh, you can take a, a cab to a ferry boat and a ferry boat to Tortola and then another cab to the other end of Tortola and then take another ferry boat to the Bitter End. And that all takes you, depending on how good you are at making connections and dragging your bags around, that can take you five or six hours or eight hours or sometimes a, a day and a half. Um, we can meet you at your flight in St. Thomas, walk you out to our airplane, and 25 minutes later, you're sipping a cocktail on the, on the, uh, uh, the front deck of the Bitter End Yacht Club or, or Sabre Rock or, or Necker Island or wherever it might happen to be. And the, the, the point of that is obviously that, that's going to be, at a, as, as Rob says, a much higher price point than your ferry boats or your, your uh, local operators with Aztecs or, or 402s or whatever. Um, th so this is, this is really geared at a different clientele than the, we're not competing with the other operators. We're, we're, we're providing a service that's an add-on service at a higher level that is clearly more expensive to the tune of two to three times more uh, uh, in cost. It costs tw twice as much to operate a caravan on amphibious floats as it does to operate a caravan on wheels. And Cessna, the Cessna guys in the back is probably cringing, saying, don't tell them that. But that's, that's the truth. And, and, and uh, um, that cost, of course, gets passed on ultimately to the, to the passengers. So, so the, it, it is a, there's a tremendous uh, opportunity, particularly for the high-end market, to be able to provide direct access from the, from the airport to a water landing between airports. Um, uh, someone earlier in the, in, the, uh, in the conference discussed single engine airplanes over water. Well, obviously, if that single engine airplane over water has a set of floats on it, it's no longer an issue, both regulatory wise and, and obviously from a safety point of view. Um, so we can fly, for instance, from St. Croix to St. Bart's and, and uh, uh, it'd be in a single engine airplane, low level, dodge the weather, stay around it, whatever. And because we have floats on the airplane, um, it's not only legal, but it's obviously a uh, much safer operation than if you're doing that out in an airplane that... You, you know, know, something I was just... I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you're you did. completely yeah. monopolizing the microphone. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm no, I was to just going to say there's something you can only do in a land plane once. You, you killed my punchline there. Man. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> now, now, I, now I wish I was shorter. Um, I just want to make one more point because, you know, John hit it on the head. Uh, you know, you're, you're attracting... I don't know if you guys can hear me. You're attracting a different kind of clientele. Um, so what you also do, I think the islands that would adopt seaplane operations, you're also attracting development. Because I'll tell you what, if you have an island that doesn't have a runway on it, you're going to use a lot of real estate if you're going to build a runway. But it's a heck of a lot cheaper to build a dock or build a ramp. And you actually, you know, save the rest of the land, you preserve it, 
you know, it's greener, but you also preserve it for development if that's the, what you decide to do. So I think there's a lot of benefits. Did, so, so what was your punchline? That was it. Jeff, that was, was it. That? You stepped on it, man. It's all right. right. Just, it was a Sully <laughs> joke. <laughs> Just I'm, keep right on. Sorry. Sorry. Water once. Um, well, you know, I think one point that you, that you made is really important is think of, the, think of the possibilities that you open up for those, those impulse uh, uh, customers that, that Vincent mentioned this morning. Uh, people that say, uh, perhaps you, you, have a, you have a couple of these airplanes around somewhere and, and you, you could certainly put together some exotic tours and say, hey, listen, we're going to go fly around and if you see some place that you really like, that's where we're going to put it in and you guys can sit and have lunch for a couple hours and the pilot can take, take a nap, I guess, floating in the airplane or something or is that what they do? Okay. That's the... Uh, Crew, crew rest. Uh, but so there, there's all kinds of possibilities, and that's that's really what we want to that's really what we want to talk about. But also, as Rob said, there's the disaster relief area, uh, aspect of this, but then all the logistics that are going to be needed to support an operation, uh, fuel maintenance, insurance. Uh, I'm sure you guys can think of some other good things too. But uh, certainly jobs, uh, and and that's really what we want to think about. But I think it's. It, because we, I've heard so many uh, buts uh, a little bit this morning, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's all about relationships, though. Uh, th this kind of thing only works when people know each other, when we get together at conferences like this and, and see each other and go, oh, I remember you from two years ago when we talked about this, that, and whatever, uh, that you start to build some trust with somebody else. Because if an operator like, like uh, any of these fellows comes up to the, uh, the tourism minister here at St. Martin and says, hi, you don't know me, but I really want to start an airline here, and it's really great, and it's a tremendous business opportunity. They, they, they don't know what to do. The first thing they're going to probably say is, we'll get back to you. All right, so it takes time. That's, that's part of that investment that everybody that's spoken before today has talked about. And what I'm saying is that you know, this is one more of those potential investments. Uh, but there are challenges. As you said, there are, uh, yeah, sure, Mind go if ahead. I speak to that? Yeah, one point of that, when uh, John asked me at, in retirement whether or not I'd be interested in going down into uh, BVI to start a seaplane operation, and I said, sure, because I'm, I'm a bit neurotic, we, we wound up uh, making a visit to the uh, BVI <laughs> and met with uh, Dennison Frazier and Coy Levins over there from the BVI uh, aviation Authority, and they were open to us, and we've been able to develop this partnership because they realize how important that commerce is to the BVI. They have their own challenges, and they're mostly regulatory challenges. So again, as we spoke earlier today, if we just open up our eyes to the, to the commerce uh, and build the relationships that we've built, they've helped us immensely. Uh, come overcome a lot of hurdles, uh, regulatory hurdles, to bring commerce into the country. So I'm um, speaking to your point, and um, I just wanted to make, make that point, but these guys have really been working sure. with us. To look for lost boats, boats are down, or lost divers. So we are an asset to the community also for search and rescue, um, and they've used us for that, and, you know, we're glad to do it. I, uh, I had to bring that one in, too, with the... Uh there's your, your luncheon. Stop in for a little luncheon somewhere and bring all the goodies. It was actually uh, on Long Island. It's um, when the uh, Long Island, the runways were underwater. We uh, based seaplanes in Great Exuma. Uh -huh. And we flew cargo into Great Exuma, transported it to the seaplanes, and brought cargo into the locations that were uh, in need of supplies. And then when we were there, we, we would fly in with the fire rescue folks and then transport injured people out. So it was the seaplanes, I mean, provided a huge asset to the Bahamas at the time. You know. And then I saw this one, and it made me think of, um, I was uh, in Nevis a couple of years ago, and when we landed, uh, I think we went into St. Kitts and then took a boat to Nevis, I believe, uh, which, again, we've already covered me in boats many times. So, But I, you know, I got to, uh, we went to the Four Seasons, and, and while we're there, I said, wow, this would be so neat. If you had a seaplane pick people up somewhere, St. Kitts or somewhere else, and land them out here, taxi right up on the beach. And some of the people in the hotel looked at me like, are you nuts? 
why not? And I think that's one thing we want to leave you with today is why not? Uh, what, what could you possibly have to lose by thinking about the possibilities? And um, let's see, let me make this work. And then I, I saw this too, and I thought, you know what? We need to remember this because this slide came from the trip that we had here a couple of years ago, and I just thought it, it really was clever, but it also talked about how the people here think. Let's not forget who, who, who I see people smiling. Whose idea was that? Come on, uh, somebody wrote that, okay. Uh, but it's, it's clever, and it, it reminds you of the point of all this. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it, it's service not just to people coming in on Lufthansa or Air France or American. It's all of those other folks that, as uh, Vincent uh, mentioned, was it Vincent that mentioned the, uh, you know, the numbers are, you have to, you have to look into them. Uh, that, that, you know, when you have high net worth individuals, they are worth a great deal more to the economy uh, than, you know, just us guys that sit in row 27 when I'm on American Airlines or something like that. Uh, but um, I think it makes an interesting and really unique opportunity. And so I think, why not? Have you guys got, I mean, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, people thinking that you're, you're bush pilots and, you know, and it's not like that. These are, these are regular certificated airline guys. Uh, they just happen to be using airplanes that land on the water and on a runway. But what else have you, you think might slow down development of a... I think, I think you hit on the head. I think the overall image, um, you know, for a long time was seaplane operation, operation with some guy barefoot you know, with a can of oil in his back pocket flying a seaplane from one place to another. And operations like John's really set the stage for, you know, no, this, is, this can be run, a seaplane operation can be run like a professional airline, you know. And he's been, what, 38 years in New York running from New York Harbor, East River, in some of the busiest airspace in the world. I mean, it's a true airline. And, and we, you know, did something very similar down in South Florida, Miami, some of the busiest airspace in the world. And we operate from one of the busiest cruise ship terminals in the world right next to yachts, or, or rather cruise ships. You know, but as long as you run it professionally, it could be done safe, effectively, efficiently, and it is sustainable. You guys agree? I think to back up what Rob said is that, and first of all, aside from the training and, the, and, and, and Rob's uh, presentation this morning was spot on, is selecting the proper individual to get in the airplane. Um, someone who, who is going to be able to fly the airplane, but is going to also be able to... Um, seaplane flying is a little bit of an art in, a distant, in, difference, in addition to a science. So you have to have someone that, that can, can think on their feet, so to speak, but, uh, but also adhere to the policies and procedures that they've been trained to do. And, and that's a whole different ball game than what you might think of seaplane flying, you know, 35, 50 years ago in Alaska, whatever that is. And the other thing to, to point out is because of companies like Textron and Cessna and, and Whip Air, the manufacturers of the floats, is that the equipment we're using today is really state-of-the-art uh, equipment. The, the avionics that are in my aircraft are better than the avionics in many of the, in many of the major airlines that are flying people in and out of this, 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 uh, this airport or any place else in the region. And, and so we have, we have the tools, that, we have turbine-powered airplanes with, with uh, 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 professionally uh, built uh, 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 amphibious floats. I mean, these things, these things are, are state-of-the-art. The avionics are state-of-the-art, both in Rob's company and my, mine. Everybody's an instrument-rated or ATP-level pilot uh, with, with uh, all of the training that goes with any other airline. And so, really, the only difference is, is that, uh, and, and to go back to the joke I tried earlier, is that we can, we can land our airplanes on the water more than once. And uh, um, everybody else uh, uh, is, is stuck having to go to the airport. And we don't have to do that. And we can open up whole new markets for island trade, uh, inter-island trade, but also within island trade. And uh, I, I really think that's the opportunity that, that, uh, that the gentleman that organized this conference uh, uh, this year, as far as the seaplane part goes, is that's the message that they're really trying to impart. One of the things I thought about, you see this thing in Vancouver where you have lots of seaplanes almost right next to cruise ships. 
for instance, St. Martin is looking for a tourism product. Uh, sometimes during the season, you got six to eight cruise ships. These people are looking for something unique and something special. Now, if it's, if it's possible, could you have some seaplanes in Great Bay? People board the seaplane in Great Bay and take a tour around? Interesting tourism product. It, I'm just planting a seed. I'm not even asking the question. I'm just, think about it. Is that a possibility? I see heads nodding. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> we'll, let, let, go ahead. I'm sorry. We've got some, I was going to say we've got time some, for some questions. Oh, yeah. And there's one right back there. A um, couple questions. Um, a lot of the pictures I saw were, were, you know, planes on relatively calm water. So I guess that's in lakes or lagoons or, or close to shore. How do, how do the pilots uh, judge that from a landing perspective that, hey, these seas are calm enough for us to, to, to land safely and so on? Do you just go based on weather reports or is it a, a hand-eye thing? I'm going to throw work? that to one of you guys. Yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit of both, at least in our operation. I'm sure John will speak to his. Um, you know, if we know in advance that we're going to go to a location, we're going to start with Google Earth, take a look to make sure if it's, if it's a protected area. Then we take a look at the winds. We may talk to the marinas. You know, and then our guys are actually required to put together a presentation and present it to the director of ops and say, hey, here's a landing, here's a landing location, here's our outs, and here's our backup. So to answer your point, you know, no, if it's rough, you're not going to land. Um, so you're going to select areas um, that are calm or calm, uh, relatively calm, I would say. But the beauty of seaplanes, it's like a sailboat. You know, if the wind shifts, you find the lee. You find that we call it the skinny water. And John, you could speak. Um, first of all, if you're, gonna, if, you, if, if you're looking at establishing uh, basically a permanent operation or, or an operation that's going to be used on a regular basis, you're going to look for that water that's almost always in the lee. I mean, it, you know, the trade winds in the, in the islands tend to blow out of the east. It might be southeast, it might be northeast, but it's basically east. Find yourself a landing area on the west side of the island. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. I mean, then... Then beyond that, you have to start looking at things like, you know, where are their coral heads? I mean, where are their reefs? We, we operate throughout the Bahamas, and uh, as does Rob's company. And, and if you're going to go to some place you've never been before, I mean, Google Earth was a game changer for us. I mean, the ability to go on and look at this and not be trying to deal with old marine charts or topographical charts or whatever, Google Earth really helps a lot. But you still have to be able to go in, and this is what I was talking about earlier about the seaplane pilot being a little bit more art than science sometimes. You've got to be able to go in and, and trust your pilot, can look at an area, evaluate that area, not only for his landing, but for his subsequent takeoff. And that's all part of the training. And, uh, and then there's certainly going to be places, I mean, I've, I've consulted for resorts who say, we want a seaplane to come in here. And you go and you look and there's crashing waves on the beach and no sheltered water. And you go, well, it isn't going to happen. I mean, there's just no machine out there today that will do that. Um, and, and the good thing about nowadays, I mean, I started flying when they were all straight floats. You had to land on the water. Now everything, you know, we've got, everybody's operating amphibious aircraft. So worst case scenario, you divert to the closest airport. What's bad about that? You're still where you're going, you know? Okay, and this, this might not, question might not make much sense, but I'm wondering, uh, do seaplanes ever do night operation? Um, only at lit runways. And there are a couple in the United States uh, our company policy is, is uh, no water operations after civil twilight, which is generally, depending on where you are in the world, 20 to 30 minutes after sunset. But there are days that, you know, an overcast day in New York City in the wintertime, sunset's already too dark. So you have to, you, you should not be landing on the water if you don't have the visibility to do it. That being said, though, I mean, you can operate right up to uh, sunset. And we can operate at night. We just can't land in the water oh, I was at mention, night. But you can. So routinely, we depart the Bahamas right at sunset and fly back to the U.S. after dark. Right. Yeah, at the airport. I stole this video from uh, from Rob, um, and so I just wanted to show you this uh, version. And I think we're going to be able to see one if we. He's out here right now. Uh, so it, maybe we can go out on the terrace if you want to take a minute and uh, get a little seaplane uh, observation experience. And then, uh, like I said, we'll be around later for some questions if you'd like. I know we didn't give you a whole lot of time on that, but uh, seaplanes wait for no one. <laughs>